Hello and welcome to the Blender demo series. In these videos, I'm going to be showing you how to use my new tool Blend for After Effects. So here's the panel here. It's a simple little panel with three buttons and one's just a help button, which gives you more information about the tool itself. And we'll just get started. So I've got this square here and I'm going to be using the first button, which is create a blend system. And we're just going to set this up now. So when you select this button, you'll notice it creates a start and end controller for you. And it duplicates your shape and renames them. So what we can do here is begin to manipulate the start and end controls like so. So you can adjust the position. We can change the rotation like so. We can do scale. And I'll increase this one to 200. And we can also do opacity. So if I set the end down to 10, like so. So this basically works as your point A and point B and the start and end of the blend. And the way it works now is if we add in more shapes by just hitting Command D, you'll see our shapes in the middle are blended between the two points that we've controlled. So we can continue to manipulate these points. So we could change the position and you'll see the middle blend shapes all react appropriately. And you could obviously do this for rotation as well, like so. Uh, Blend also supports 3D layers, so we could turn 3D on, and then we could add some Z positioning to the end. And if I quickly jump to two views, you'll see here how it's distributed the middle shapes between the two points, like so. Okay, I'm now gonna show you how delay works with the blend system. So if I hit preview, you'll see our start and end controllers are just animating up and down individually. Um, so if we click on the start controller now, you'll see by default, when you create a blend system, it creates this blend controls effect for you. And if you toggle this down, it should be open anyways, you'll see you've got delay amount, even delay and reverse delay. So if we, first of all, I'll introduce some more blend shapes. So now we've got four shapes in our blend and you can see the two in the middle are moving half the distance and they're all moving at the same time at the moment. If I stop this panel quickly. So if I add two here, this will delay everything by two frames. So now what you'll see is the start controller moves first, followed by this shape, this one, and finally our end controller. So we kind of get this kind of snake effect. If I come in here and then tick the reverse delay, you'll see how this changes. And now we have our end controller moving first and we go from right to left finally with our start controller moving last. And if I reverse this, you can see that's physically reversing the delay. Now, if I now select even delay, and this will be easier to see if I add six shapes, you'll see our ends are moving at the same time, followed by these two shapes, and then finally the two middle shapes. And if I crank this delay to four, it will really emphasize what's going on here. And then if I have even delay selected and reverse delay selected, you'll see now the center of the delay moves first and then it works its way outwards towards the end and start controllers. So that's how you can use the blend control effects to manipulate delays throughout the blend system. So I'm going to show you how blend adjustment works. So if you go to the start controller and you can find blend controls and here you have a slider for blend adjustment. So in order to preview this, I need to add some more blend shapes. So 
At the moment, our controllers are set up. So we have a fill color of green for the start and red for the end. And they are simply rotated minus 45 and 45, which gives us this blend we have here. Now, if I change the blend adjustment to minus one, you'll see one of our shapes disappear. Minus two, one, another one disappears and three, they're all gone. And if we do positive, we get the same result. So it's hard to see what this is actually doing until we add some keyframes. So if we start from positive three and at one second, we go to negative three. And finally, at two seconds, we will loop back to positive three and we'll easy ease these keyframes and we'll see what happens. So now when I preview, you can see the shapes in the middle are pushed to our start and end controllers. And obviously this would work the same if this was scaled to 40, for example, and you'll see they'll go from small to big. Now this is a way to basically animate the blend between your start and end controllers, which is a nice little feature to have. Okay, I'm now gonna be showing you how you can add extra properties to your blend system. So let's say we want to add roundness to the squares. So we'll come down and we'll find the roundness property. And what we're going to need to do is put in some keyframe information to define the extremes of the blend. So the first keyframe we'll leave at zero and we'll type in 130 on the second keyframe, which will then turn our square into a nice circle. And then what I'm going to do is delete the old blend because we'll need to update that shape. And we're going to just select these keyframes and we're going to hit the plus icon. And what you'll see is this is now added an expression to the roundness. And if we go to the start controller, you'll see we now have rectangle path roundness slider and also on the end controller, like so. So now if we add more shapes to our blend, and if we come to the start, and if we crank this control up to 100, you'll see now we have a circle which slowly smooths off to a square. And if we add in more shapes, you'll see how that updates the blend. So that's how you can add other properties. Um, you can add several properties at the same time. So we could have came in and we could add a trim path. And for this, we could animate the start and the end. So we'll go from zero and 100 to both 50 on the second keyframe. And if I select these keyframes and hit the add button again, you'll see we now get controllers for the start and the end. And we will need to delete these shapes and update them so they get the add, the trim perhaps property. And then on the end, if we crank these sliders up to 100, you'll see that the shapes then blend off to zero. Or we could do inverted like so and you see if we move these shapes the controllers these shapes all move appropriately like we did in the first demo so that's how you add properties using blend okay so let's say we wanted to control trim path start and end with just one controller this is where grouped properties comes into play so here we have a shape with a trims path and the same keyframe set. So what we can do this time is we can select both properties and if we hold Alt while selecting the plus icon, we can then make a grouped property slider control. So this will now open up this dialog where we can name our group. So I'm gonna call this trim paths and select okay. And then if I update our shapes, You'll now see on the start and on the end controllers, we have a slider for trim paths. So if I set this to 100%, you'll see now that both the start and the end have gone to 50 on the keyframes. 
and obviously on the end we can set this to 50 and it would update like so. So that's how you do group slider controls. Okay, I'm now going to show you how you can add color to a blend system. So I'm going to select our first square and I'm going to toggle find down until I find the color of the stroke. And I'm like before, I'm just going to add in some keyframe information. So the first keyframe will be red. The second will be green. And I'm now going to show you how you can provide more information for our sliders. So I'm going to add a third keyframe of blue. And like before, I'm going to select these keyframes and hit the add button. We'll just chuck in several shapes now. And I'm going to give our shapes some more room by adjusting these controllers positions. <clears throat> so you'll see now both all of our shapes are red because our sliders are both set to zero. So if I come to the end and set this to 100, what you'll notice is we go from red to our second keyframe in the middle, which was green. And finally, our third keyframe at 100%, which is blue. So what we can also do is animate these controllers. So we could start with both of our sliders at 50. And we can animate out to the final end colors. So if we preview this, you'll see we go from green to red at the start and blue at the end, like so. Now this method allows you to add in more keyframe information. So what we can do is we could come in here and add a yellow in the middle too. So then if we just update our shapes, like so, you'll see when we come to the end here, we now have the red to a green, the green to a yellow, and finally the yellow to a blue. So this method allows you to add as many colors in the midsections of your gradient as you want but you are limited to how you can animate the controllers because if I start to slide this up, you'll see it has to cycle through all of the colors before finally getting to blue, which you may want or you may not. And this is why I've built an alternative method for adding color, which I'll show you now. <clears throat> so here again, I'm just going to find the stroke color and this time I'm not going to add any keyframes and I'm simply going to hold shift and select the add button. And I will add in some more shapes. And then this time what you'll notice differently is they're already red and that's because these have been given slider color controls now. Sorry, they've been given color controls instead of sliders and by default they come in as red. So what we can do now is we can come to the start and we can add a green. And what you'll see now is we get a gradient from green to red. And we cannot, with this method, control the middle color. It will always just be what the middle color is between the two, two color inputs we put on the controllers. But what we can do is we can animate any colors we want. So we could start both of these off as blue, like so. And then they could animate to green and red. Red could then become yellow, whilst the start maintains as green. And then finally, we could change this to yellow. And this just allows us to animate our ends to whatever color we want. We can't control the middle, but it gives us a little bit well, not more control, it gives you different control over how you manipulate the colors. So that's the two methods of adding color to a blend system. Okay, I'm now going to show you how the blend system handles stroke width. So with this first shape, we're just going to toggle down and find stroke width. And we're just going to quickly hit the add button. And we'll just 
update a few more shapes. So the problem with stroke width is if I scale the end controller, you'll see that the stroke itself becomes thicker as the controller scales. So if you go to your start controller, you'll notice it's also added a checkbox. And if you select this, it will make the stroke whips consistent regardless of the scale, which is very handy. I mean, you may want it to increase in thickness. That's completely up to you. So obviously I didn't add any keyframes. So if we slide these controllers, they're currently not going to do anything. So what we can also now do is animate our actual width. So we can come in here, leave it at six, and after one frame, we can increase it to 12. And if we refresh our shapes, we see despite this being at 400%, they're still all at six points on the stroke. And if I come to the end now and increase it to 100, you'll see now we get the blend from six to 12 stroke on our stroke width. And obviously if I untick consistent stroke width, you'll see they get really chunky. So yeah, that's how you control stroke widths using blend. Okay, I'm gonna now show you how to build slightly more complex things using the blend tool. So if I just preview this animation here, you'll see we've kind of got these squares that flip out in a fake 3D effect before forming this like pyramid. Um, and I'm gonna run you through sort of how I built this using a pre-comp. Um, so here I've got a pre-comp, which is then used in the blend effect and controlled by a few controllers to create this effect. Um, here is a new cube, which I'm now gonna run you through. So this is the animation of the cube itself. So we've just got this square circle, which turns into a square and then does a 3D flip back into a square again. So I'm gonna show you how I can rig all this using a few expressions and using master properties to then link to the actual blend controllers to manipulate the pre -comps. Um So I'm just gonna jump in and get started here. So on the cube, I need to create some sliders. Um, I've already left the X and Y on by mistake, but yeah, anyways, let's create a new slider. So if we just add a slider, and I'm gonna call this shape transform. So what I wanna do is link this animation here to this slider so I can control it by just adjusting this slider value. So I'm just gonna alt click on the first keyframes property and I'm gonna type control equals, and then I'm just gonna use the pick whip to the R slider. And now I'm gonna write the actual code, which is gonna be a value at time expression. So we'll do value at time, and we're just gonna write control, divide by 100. And all the dividing by 100 does is gives us slightly more control over the slider value. I'm just gonna copy this expression and paste it onto every keyframed property. Like slow. So now if I scrub through, you'll see nothing works. It's not animating. But if I go through this slider, you'll see it begins to control our animation. So I know now because I've divided it by 100, I know one second will be 100 on the slider control like so, and then one to two seconds will be 100 to 200, like that. So, I've linked that up. Um, I will show you these X and Ys and why that's important. So what I'm gonna need to be able to do, this is just a pre-comp with the, the cube here, is I'm gonna need to scale the width 
and height of our shape later on. And obviously you can see we've got, even if I turn on continuous rasterization, we kind of get these inconsistencies in the stroke width. So this is why I've got these X and Y sliders. So what I'm gonna do here is in my contents of the shape, let's just toggle this all down, hang on. So I've got these two shapes, which are all the keyframe informations to control the animation. And then I've got this transform group. And here, if I break apart the scale, you'll notice if I increase the width here, our stroke maintains its correct thickness and same with the height. So I wanna be able to control these on the outside here basically. So instead of adjusting this scale, I can adjust the, the group transform scale. So that's where these sliders come into play. So I'm just gonna change this back to 100 and 100. Sorry, I got interrupted with my recording there. So I'm just gonna, I had to cut and I'm just gonna continue from where I was. Um, so I'm gonna add an expression here to the transform group scale. So we need to write X scale. And we're going to link it to our slider. And we need to write Y scale and link it to the Y slider. And we need to write an array. And we have X scale and Y scale. So what this will do is allow us to use these controllers to control the values down here. So because we want to use these controllers in the on the pre-comp itself, we need to use mass properties. So we're gonna to go to window and essential, essential graphics. I'm just going to hit E to reveal our effects and each one of these sliders we're going to add. So we'll add this one and call it shape transform. Go X scale Y scale. And for these two scale ones, we want to just make sure that the range of the slider is a thousand should be enough on both of these. Great. And lastly, we need to be able to control the stroke width from the master properties too. So if we find the stroke width, we're going to add that too. And then we can close the graphics panel. So when we come to our pre-comp, you'll notice we now have master properties. We've got scale transform where once we slide through this, it goes through our animation. We've got X scale. So even when we've, we're going through the animation, we can control the X width and we can control the Y like so. And finally, we can change our stroke width. So if I just reset these real quick, right, let's see what... right, so now we can start to build the blend system. So we're going to select the, the pre-comp and hit the blend. So for my animation, I believe the inside was smaller, like so. So I just go to 50. And obviously now we're getting stroke width problems. So if I come here, select the stroke width and I can click add. And now you'll see we have the continuous stroke width checkbox. So I'm gonna turn that on and just update my shape. So now you can see where 
no matter what I scale this to, I've got the consistent stroke width, which is nice. So I'm just going to change that to like 30. Um, I need to add these to the controllers too, so I might as well do that now. So I'm just going to quickly solo this first one. And I'm going to actually go back to 100. And I'm going to push this through to our final position, which will be 200 on here. So whilst this is at 200, I want to be able to manipulate the X to maybe 30 on the whip. And I guess 30 on the height. So these will be my smallest values. The Y, obviously, I need at 100 for when we're here. So I need to do X, or so at 100. So this is kind of my middle value. But that's the two extremes for the Y. But then also, when I'm back here, I want to be able to push the X width out a lot so I can create the pyramid effect. So I'm just going to set this to 300. And then obviously for the shape transform, I need to animate through this whole slider. So I need 0 and 200. So now those are set. We can select those keyframes and add them. And I will just update my blend effect. Set this back to 30. And obviously we're really small right now, so we need to set the Y to 100, the X to 50, not 100, sorry. And I need to do that on both. So X is 50 and Y is 100. So now I'm back to where I started. Cool, right. So I believe the start was the square shape. Let's just quickly check. Okay, now so I've got square on the outside, circle in the middle. So if I'm going to rebuild this accurately, I'm just going to turn these off for now. So that's fine. So I want this transform to be at 50. So I've got the square on the outside, circle in the middle. I'm going to select a keyframe here. I'm also going to keyframe position and the scale of the start. So let's just push these forward. So let's say after 20 frames, I want this to go from 50 to 1. No, sorry, wrong one. I need to animate the start. Where is it? Here it is. So this, I want to go from 0 to 50. So they both become squares. So then we animate from circle to square. And then from here, I want to just animate this one up. This one probably down. I'm going to scale this back up to 100 so we get the initial values and then we're going to adjust the X and Y scales. I'm just going to plot in the keyframes. So here I want the X to go down to zero and the y to go down to zero as well so we've got a cube on the top and on this one i want the y to go down to zero but i want the x to go out to 100 and obviously that's quite big let's chuck in a few more shapes now we'll go for five and to be honest, 100 is looking a bit much. We'll scale this in a bit, maybe 90. 
And then here we can just adjust the positioning slightly until we get these to line up nicely. And for the sake of this demo, I'm just going to leave that there. Oh yeah, I haven't actually animated the transition. So I need to animate from 50 to 102. And these cubes are slightly smaller. And from 50 to 100. Here we go. So now my positions are slightly out of whack. There we go. So now we have this animation where we've got a circle and a square on the outside. The circles become squares and then the whole thing flips. I believe on my actual animation, I put an extra keyframe up here just so I can distort that. And I think I just made it a rover cross time keyframe. And when you do all the easing and stuff, you can really like fine tune this. Then I get this flip and finally form in this type of pyramid. Um, and the last thing I did was add some delay. Probably not a lot, probably 0.5. So then if I just select everything and I'm just going to hit F9, just do some basic easing and preview this animation. Like so. There we go. The delay is not very much. Let's just crank the delay to one second so you can really see that. So you can see it starts at the top and the rest falls out as well. Nice. So obviously it's not as fine tuned as this because I spent a little bit longer on this, but that gives you an idea about how you can combine loads of stuff with the blend feature let's just preview that to create pretty interesting things i even had some rotation on this one actually which i could probably just copy onto my rebuild and if i Copy that onto here as well, and I believe I just inverted this one, so this would be minus 180. So then you'll get like an interesting flip as well whilst it's rotating out, like so. And obviously the blend does all the magic in between. And then if you decide you actually just want four, you can just add four in, and you get obviously slightly different interesting shapes. So that's how you can use master properties and how you can use pre-comps. So there's quite a lot of power with this tool if you plan it out, I guess, a little bit. This took a little bit of thinking for me to figure it out, mainly because of the stroke width issues you get when you, if I just scale this, for example, you'll see stroke width doesn't play very nicely. That's just the nature of stroke width. There's not much you can do about that, bar doing a little work around like I showed you just then. So yeah, that is Blend. I hope you like the tool. Uh, feel free to ask me any questions and also share with me stuff you've built with the tool. Thanks a lot, guys.